Hey, this is LOA Today, the Law of Attraction show. Welcome to LOA Today. My name is Walt Thiessen. Today is Tuesday, January 29, 2013. With us today, Deb Scott. She's a certified professional coach who specializes in working with individuals, businesses, and corporate environments to transform ineffective group and personal dynamics into high-powered individuals and teams. A biology major in college, Deb was a, a, an award-winning sales and leadership specialist. After 20 years of background in cardiac surgery sales, she now applies her sales and business background to motivational speaking and consulting. She speaks and writes about how you can turn things around, whether you're in sales, marketing, advertising, hiring, or team building. And she is the author of the book, The Sky is Green and the Grass is Blue, Turning Your Upside-Down World Right-Side Up. And Deb walks the walk, having overcome sexual abuse, a dysfunctional family, others' alcoholism, depression, and being the sole caregiver to both her parents and financial devastation. She's the host of The Best People We Know show, a top-rated show on Blog Talk Radio with over a half a million listeners. And uh, Deb Scott, welcome to the show. Well, it is just a privilege and honor to be with you, Walt and Louise, and all of your great listeners. Well, the privilege, privilege is all ours. We're really just tickled pink to have you here. We're in the Best People We Know Club with the Mutual Admiration Society going right along there. That's right. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see. Where do we start? Let's start with your book, The Sky is Green and the Grass is Blue. I mean, just the title alone says, my goodness, the whole world looks upside down to me, and that apparently is what it's all about. But give us a little bit more of a taste than that. What's it about? Well, you know, I think it's that old saying, if you look at things differently, um, they become different. And being a focus in the law of attraction, you certainly can appreciate and understand that the way that you look at things is going to come back to you. If you don't enjoy your own company, you can't expect anybody else to. So you have to be the person and you have to walk the talk of the person that you want to attract, the things that you want in your life. So the sky is green and the grass is blue is about turning things around and seeing things differently and considering new possibilities and really being inspired to consider that those things that you don't like in your life, the things that you don't want in your life, we all have skeletons in the closet, we have all suffered sorrow and pain in some way, but we all want to be able to turn those tragedies into something fabulous. So that's what it's about, knowing that that pressure that you've been under, you know, that coal that just did well under pressure became the diamond. That's what it's about. You're a gift. Unwrap yourself. You're a diamond. Let's get you to shine. The world needs you. That's a very cool message, absolutely. And and you have the background to draw upon to write something like that, especially in sales. I mean, uh, not all of our listeners, of course, are in sales. They're in a wide range of fields. But we can all at least appreciate how difficult sales can be. I mean, especially, I have to tell you, I had a rather silly um, image that went through my head when I was reading part of your, your uh, CV there, uh, the part where you had a background in cardiac surgery sales. I had this really strange image of this guy at a ball game with a little tray in front of him saying, heart surgery, get your heart surgery here. <laughs> of course, that's not what it is at all, but... But I'm sure that background must have given you some really both difficult situations to learn from and some very positive experiences. Can you touch on that for just like a little second here? Mm, yeah. Well, for me, what I spent a lot of time with the, you know, the the operating room mask and the and that and the hat hair and all that stuff because. I, I was actually in surgery frequently at Mass General, Brigham and Women's, or doing conventions around the country. So I was in the operating room, and, you know, being in the operating room right there um, as a patient's being cut open, as their heart's being stopped, um, as they're, you know, being, you know, really in a moment of life or death. And I think that that um, experience, firsthand really had me focus not only on the heart physically, but on the heart spiritually. You know, the center of us all is our heart. And we're all here for a very short amount of time. And when we look at things in the perspective that we're not staying, but we're also not going to, I believe truly that our soul lasts forever. So this is just, you know, 
a small skin suit experience in the big picture of eternity, but realizing that we're not staying and that we all have a limited amount of time, it challenges each of us to consider, what is my purpose? Why am I here? What do I need to do before I, before I leave? You know, um, the quote, the best thing you can do with your life is to create something that will outlast it. So it's really important to take time for your life. It's important to reflect. You know, um, Aristotle or Socrates, the unexamined life isn't worth living. So I think it's really important because when the time to perform arrives, the time to prepare has passed. So hopefully your show, what Walt, what you and Louise are doing, and this time where listeners may be, you know, here, what I think is maybe a divine appointment, if I could be so bold, will cause us to pause in our life and consider, you know, what is the meaning of me being here and how can I take those bad things that I think are miserable and use them to make myself better, happier, more productive, and also everyone else that I meet. So the cardiac surgery experience in the practical sense of the heart and death and life and the importance of each soul and knowing that each person on that operating room table had a mother, a father, a daughter, you know, grandchildren out in the operating room holding their breath, saying their prayers and waiting really gives us, um, I think, a good healthy shock treatment that we really need to take time to think about what we're thinking about. Yeah, absolutely true. And in fact, uh, a couple of thoughts went through my mind. First of all, you were using some phrases that are similar to phrases that Louise uses. Um, one of her phrases is, uh, we are spiritual beings having a human experience. And uh, in fact, the two of us feel like we're very much on a spiritual journey in our lives. So when you talk about how important it is to kind of stop and take stock and how a situation like heart surgery kind of forces you to do that, that really resonated with us. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I think that we all help each other in the journey. You know, if we're all going down the river of life, see, I love these quotes, Walt and uh, Louise. This is why <laughs> we're, we're mutual fans. I just love those little pithy quotes, little mind vitamins that I can take and digest to get me, you know, to get my clear vision on. But if we're all listening right now and we're in that river of life together, we're in different boats, but we're all traveling that same journey. And, you know, Eleanor Roosevelt, you can't live long enough to make all the mistakes yourself. You have to learn from other people. You know, I think that's what it's about. And I think that's your passion for having this radio show. And I know it is for mine. Um, we do need to share our shine. And as much as we don't think it matters, it does. Because each person will touch somebody in a unique way. And if I think about the different experiences that have changed my life, in many cases, in most cases, I've never even met that person or I've never really talked with that person. You know, it, it's just amazing how powerful events and emotions and passions can be. You know, that little rudder on a big ship makes a big difference. And that we don't all have, we don't have all the answers. Some people have um the answers may be in a slight disguise or they'll say something that resonates or leads us to something that fits better for our own life, but that the shared experience makes us feel less alone and we help each other. You know, we, it's almost, I don't know how to describe it other than um, on ice skates or roller skates when you played whip. You know, you pull that person forward, then they pull you forward. That person pulls you forward. And we each help each other, if we're willing um, and open, to make the next steps forward. Mm -mm. And, and you know, Louise, it's like, hello, you're not going to always know until the end. You know, you have to live your life forward. You understand it in hindsight. But that's not the importance. So if the focus is, you know, doing as you just described – eventually you'll you'll get the reason but hopefully moments like this give us the hope the excitement and the inspiration to consider that it's all good or it could all be potentially used for something good 
And to me, that's, that's what gets me up in the morning. And that's what keeps me when things are really bad and, hey, everybody has down days, bummer things happen to them. And if somebody tells you they don't, they're lying. Run away from them as fast as you can. They're That's lying. Right. You That's know? right. And, and you can't compare your inside with somebody else's outside. And I think that really what the, what the sky is green, the grass is blue, what the best people we know, what I really want to do is just help people consider you know, the options, to consider the possibilities. And, and sometimes just that hope of hearing somebody, as you said, somebody else's story. You know, we often get so stuck in the muck and we need to dump that stinking thinking and we forget that if somebody else had something similar to us and we see that they overcame it, then it's like, hey, it's the four-minute mile syndrome. You know what? I didn't think that was possible. I didn't think that there was any hope for me, you know, because my child passed away at a young age or because I lost my job or I, you know, someone stole a million bucks from me or I just got diagnosed with this health condition. You know, when we're in that moment, in that place, it's really hard to think, you know, happy, good thoughts. But if we know that somebody else has been there and we can see something great that happened to them as a result of it that they're grateful for wow doesn't that shift the whole landscape you know that's it, right it makes you feel less lonely and the possibilities open up for us right and you know i just saw somebody i think it might have been melissa gall on facebook i'm a, just a quote fanatic i'm a i'm a quote addict but in a good healthy way i think a quoteaholic um, it, a, a quote addict, yeah. <laughs> and it said um, something about famous failures, and it was all these people that had all these these famous people that we all, you know, whether it be Walt Disney or Lucille Ball or Michael Jordan or whoever. And it was all these famous people that most of us listening would say, hey, I recognize that name, and that was a successful person. And, you know, then you read all they got fired, they got kicked off the team, you know, they 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 suffered all these things and, and we don't we don't think about that. We just look at oh, look at what they did. But when we understand some of the things and the obstacles and the tragedies and the sorrows and the sufferings they went through, wow, doesn't that doesn't that say, Hey, I'm not finished yet. I'm not at the end of my story. I'm still writing the chapters in my book. You know, there's 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 something I can learn there. And that's why it's so imperative to take time to consider what you're feeding your body, but what you're feeding your soul. Your eyes are, are taking in those messages. Your ears, what are you listening to? You have to have that good self-esteem and love yourself enough to really consider everything that you expose yourself to is a seed that you're planting. And you don't want to be watering weeds, and you don't want to buy the stuff that is going to just, you know, hurt you. So it's very, very important, as you know, to be careful who you associate with, what you listen to, and, you know, befriend yourself because you're going to spend more time with yourself than anybody else in this lifetime, in case you didn't already notice. <laughs> <laughs> well, so much of what you said resonates in that I – came to a point in my life when I made the conscious decision to take control of my life. I had let life control me, and I didn't like the results, so I started to focus on taking control wherever I could and making choices to read things that were uplifting, only watch movies that left me feeling good. Now, was I 100% successful in that? No, I watched Dallas, and I watched some of the <laughs> junk that was on TV. Yep. But predominantly, I made a shift and did it again even more so um, about 10 years ago and have seen the results, even in the day-to-day -day running into people in the market, or I've got to go resolve an issue with, um, oh, say, you know, the electric company or something, and if I went in – Previously, with a feisty attitude, I probably would have gotten gotten nowhere. But going in thinking, okay, these people are reasonable, they're going to be understanding, and we're going to resolve it. Wow, it happened. Um, so consciously grabbing my life by the reins and saying, no, I'm going to direct um, 
the journey as much as I can by the choices and the thoughts that I have, as you had said. Mm, that is so awesome, Louise. I'm just so loving that because it is true. And and somebody listening who what's so great about what you just said is, you know, it's not about doing it perfectly. It's it's progress. It's not perfection. Right. And right. you know, as we stated in the beginning of the show, we are those spiritual beings having this human experience. Well, remember that part of being human is, you know, just kind of let things happen. Don't be so focused on, I have to have control of even what the result will be of this positive seed that I plant. You know, if I cut my finger, if you cut your finger, you know, I may put some antiseptic on it and a Band-Aid, but, you know, I don't really work hard to tell my platelets to go and do their job. (laughs) You know what I mean? My body is naturally wanting to heal itself. And I think that that's what we have to do, you know, when we read good books, when we listen to good shows, when we surround ourselves with good people, when when we are around all of that, it's like putting the antiseptic and the Band-Aid on, and things will naturally heal oftentimes without us even knowing. And, and your example was great. You know, you're in there, you're just in your day dealing with somebody in a business situation. All of a sudden you find yourself, without even realizing it, you're not really upset about the result. You're going <laughs> in there knowing that, hey, they're a person, I'm a person, I'm not attached to their results, I will control what I can do and let the rest go. See, it just it's just one of those things where we have to, really understand that the world and God is for us, not against us, you know? It's it's that healing in the cut. If I even break a leg and smash my body up, eventually it will heal. And, you know, and that's the way it is in our spiritual life as well, I believe. You know, it's funny, you were talking for a moment there, you made a little analogy about uh, not having to tell your platelets what to do and so forth. And I had this image in my mind, this little Napoleon inside the head saying, okay, neurons, fire! <laughs> I know, I know. It's just like, gosh, you know, it's like, it, it, it's my, sometimes my life, Walt, is totally none of my business. And, <laughs> you know, I just can't get involved in controlling other people because I have a hard enough time just taking care of my own thoughts, you know, and controlling what I'm dealing with. And I think it's, you know, we keep that focus to just, if I keep the focus on myself, that one finger pointed at you means there's three fingers pointed back at me. If I can keep the focus on myself, if I can focus on, you know, doing the best that I can do by by taking that time to be silent and meditating or prayer, by surrounding myself, you know, with good people and good thoughts and good shows like yours. You know, if I can get out and do a little volunteer work and remember that if I throw manure or flowers at someone, it sticks to me first. So I want to go out and volunteer to throw out flowers, and that will naturally stick to me, and volunteering is a great way to do that. You know, if I can get up in the morning and be grateful that, you know what, I took a shower this morning and most of the people in the world don't even have clear water to drink. I think if we get down to those simple basics and we get into those good habits, all of a sudden we'll just see that everything falls together. And the result of that, and we know that we've changed when we're in situations that would normally stress us out, really confuse us, that we're feeling that deep peace, you know, under the ocean. It's calm. It's okay. Whatever happens, it's okay. And if we just keep that focus on ourselves and we just are focused on, okay, what am I here to do? And I want to do it the best that I can. The result of that will be the peace, will be the happiness, will be the good self-esteem in a humbling way that will help others want to be their best as well and it's not really super difficult but you know I think that the world is constantly bombarding us with so many lies that we tend to buy that we just have to get you know and grab a new pair of glasses to see the world we don't even know that we're not see we don't we don't even know that we don't have 2020 vision until somebody gives us the glasses and says okay now read it with these glasses on and you're like oh my gosh look at how clear and crisp everything is Mm -hmm. so you know and it's a process I I don't know it's just it's a process it's a process of continuing to prune things out that don't work just like I prune my rose bush you know I have that big big long beautiful um, stem 
that I really don't want to trim, but if I don't cut that off, the whole part, the better part of it won't grow to be as awesome as it could be. So sometimes we have to do do those things and take care of ourselves to know that, you know, we're worth that time and we're worth that effort. And that's not selfish, that's unselfish. You know, to be your best will help everybody else be their best. Yeah, I've <clears throat> sort of discarded the word selfish because it's come to have such a negative connotation, and I use the term self-caring instead. Yes, that's really, that is self-care. It's so important. But, you know, I, I think that sometimes a sense of humor, too. If You know, I put spices on my food. Um, salt and pepper. I think the spice of life is sometimes you got to have a sense of humor. Ebert Hubbard, don't take life too seriously. You'll never get out alive. You know, <laughs> I mean, we got to just realize that, you know, sometimes you got to have a sense, you got to have a sense of humor about things because it, it can, it can get, it can get too depressing otherwise. You know, That's you have right. to look, you have to look for the, for the humor in it. The humor helps us get over a lot of the rough spots. It helps dissipate a lot of tension, um, and like you said, it helps banish or hold back depression and gloom and doom. Um, so why the heck not? <laughs> no. Hey, absolutely. And, you know, I think that we we really tend to think sometimes that we know everything. I mean, right now I'm listening here in the Boston area. Somebody else may be listening in, you know, the U.K. Somebody else may be listening in Florida. Somebody else may be listening in California. You know, think of all the people, you know, all the millions and millions of people. Everybody's doing something different, and they're all in different places. I mean, there's so much going on. There's so many possibilities. And, and, you know, you have to open your mind to work, that parachute. You know, the parachute is great, but if you don't open it going down, you will be dead when you get to the bottom. (laughs) You have a mind. Open it. Open it to the possibilities. And that, you know, having choices is the best way to get rid of depression and all the other junk that we don't want because there are more choices available than we could ever possibly imagine. But how can you know about those choices if you don't read about them, if you don't listen to them, you know, if you don't seek people who who engage in finding choices? So you want to, you know, it's that law of attraction. You know, you, wanna, you don't want to catch a cold, you, you know, something that's contagious about positive thinking. That's what you want to catch. And, and that's, I think once we get that good self-esteem, once we know that, hey, you know what? I'm I'm here for a reason. It really shifts the direction so that you kind of look at things in a whole new way. And and that's to me the great thing about aging if there can be anything great about aging is the <laughs> wisdom, the wisdom yes. that we take, yes. you know. Well, you like analogies. Um the one that came to mind was the as you were talking was the pebble in the pond in that if I'm in a good frame of mind and I'm feeling good about myself and I go into whatever situation, work, relationship, family, the grocery store, in a positive frame of mind, other people cannot help but respond to that. Now, if they're in a really bad place, they may respond in a very negative way, but you've still brushed up against them and probably nine times out of ten, you're going to have a positive effect on the people around you. It may be fleeting or it may be, gee, I really like that person. I always feel good after they've left or they always say something nice to me or they're always in a good mood. Um, and mm. I think you'll probably know this this term, you know, um, pra- how do they say it? Um, I can't even think of it now. But people are going to be attracted by your example. Right. And yes, it's just... like um, St. Francis of Assisi. Um, preach always, and only when necessary, use words. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's it, because words, as we were talking about before, you hear a lot of lies out there, and there's a lot of people preaching. But are they demonstrating? Can they really walk the walk? Can they show it to you in their day-to-day lives? And that's going to have much more of an effect. 
Mm. Well, I, cer- I certainly know it does for me because, like I said earlier, if someone tells me that they're happy all the time, everything's good, you know, they've mastered uh, the business of living, I'm like, okay, away as fast as I can from you because you know that's not real. You know that's not true. And we all want somebody that, you know, it's, it's um, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And, Louise, that's so perfect. And that's, I think, what your show is about and mine and what the listeners are here for is, I want somebody that is authentic, that I can connect with, that I can relate to. I want somebody who's been there and done that and somebody that can take what they did to bridge to the other side and help me get that in my own life. Because it doesn't matter what people say. If you can't, if they can't, you know, give it to you in a recipe that you can duplicate, it it doesn't do any good. And I think that it's so important you know, to remember that um, that's 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 what we have to do is be able to take the information and duplicate it in our own life, in our own way, you know, in our own form. You um, talked about using spices, and the um, recipe analogy is great. If somebody shares a recipe with you, you take the basic one and you add the spices that work for you that that um, tickle your palate. Exactly, exactly. So it's not about, you know, it's not, it's not about the compare and despair. It's not about being somebody else. It's about being your own brand of you. Right. And I think that, right. you know, one of the things that helped me a lot and continues to help me a lot is when bad things happen to good people, when you have those bad situations, instead of it being you against them or right or wrong, Make it more of a near or far. I always ask myself this, and believe me, I'm not always having warm and fuzzies, you know, when somebody's really infuriating me in that moment, but my reaction doesn't have to be my response. I'm not my emotions. I can have a thought, but that doesn't mean anything until I actually accept it and integrate it. You know, I open the door to let someone in my house. I have a choice before they come in or not. Do I want them to come in? They may be at the door. The thought may be in my head. But do I have to open the door and invite it in to stay? Yes or no. That's my choice. But I think what's really important is to ask yourself in the midst of all of that um, emotion is, okay, all right, for me I'll say, okay, God, what can I learn from this? God, what are you trying to show me? Because salt only hurts on an open wound. And the fact that I am in pain or upset, by somebody, what they say, what they did, what they didn't do, what they did do, what they did 20 times, what they didn't do 20 times. The fact that I'm upset, what does that tell me? Just like a stop sign in a road. Stop. Something's upsetting you. What is, it, what, what is upsetting you? What can I learn from this? Well, maybe, and it could be a million things, and that's where coaching or therapy or just reading a book or, you know, working through it, that's where it helps. Just break it down. Okay, I'm upset about this person. Why am I upset? Well, maybe because I feel like I don't have any control over this situation. Why do I feel like I don't have any control? Because I don't see any other choice and I don't, I don't want to have to deal with all these negative emotions. Well, what are my choices? Who's been in this situation and had different choices? You know, it's just a matter of, you know, practice. It's like any sport. Olympians don't become that way just because they dropped out of bed one morning. They <laughs> practice, you know. They work. And, and you know, it takes practice and work to rein in your thoughts and say, what can I learn from this? What are you, what are you trying to teach me, God? What, what is this? What, where's the good in this for me? What am I going to learn? Maybe I still need to work on that self-esteem issue. You know, maybe I'm not really healed from, you know, this hurt that happened before. Maybe I'm still feeling responsible and I have guilt about X, Y, and Z. You know, just because we have this reaction, that is a symptom. That's not the real issue. So if you look at when you're upset, and you know, okay, this is a wound that I need to heal. This is an opportunity for me to really get this thing healed so that the salt will hit my arm and there's no sore so it won't ever hurt. And isn't that a better way? Isn't that a better way? You know, I don't go drive down to the grocery store and say, oh, gosh, there's another stop sign. Oh, my gosh, I hate it. There's a yield sign. I'm so stressed (laughs) out. Oh, my God. I say, hey, 
I'm glad there's warning signs there for me to protect myself from getting hurt. And these these things that we don't like in our life, if we look at them as, hey, these are good warning signs to protect me from getting more hurt. You know, and then it's just a matter of, all right, how do I how do I turn that around? How do I how do I protect myself and heal on those things? And I, to me, it's a much I mean, that's the story, and I'm sticking to it. It's a much better way to live. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, um, we had a a guest on earlier this month. I don't know if you've had him on, Steve Rizzo. Uh, he came up. He's coming on. Actually, he is coming, coming on? on the show in a couple of months, I think. Okay, yeah, well, he just came out with his book, uh, which has a wonderful title, Get Your Shift Together. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, he, he was uh, talking with us about the same concept, in other words, how you deal with, with negative situations as they happen. And uh, his concept of how to do it is, well, it's what you'd expect from somebody who was a stand-up comedian, but it's also a really good one, I think. He says, look at whatever that negative situation is in the midst of when it's making you angry or, or scared or frustrated or depressed or whatever it might be, and see if you can see where the absurd side is. Because if you can see what the absurd side is, then you can laugh at it. And once you can laugh at it, you take all its power away. I thought that was a really great message. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. We can echo that one. And, um, you know, I love that. I'm, I'm looking forward to, I, I, yeah, I'm looking forward to having him on the oh, show. Oh, he's going to be great. You're, you're going to have so much fun. He'll make you laugh like crazy. <laughs> Laughter is always the best medicine. It releases endorphins, and they make you feel good all through your body. Right. So that's that's a good thing. You know, and I think that one of the, the, the themes, the, the basic themes and in, in everything that, you know, we're talking about today is the expectation is to not ever, you know, oh, I'm never going to be sad, I'm never going to be bummed out, I'm never going to be upset. See, that expectation, that is wrong. It's how we handle it and what we do with it. And, you know, that that's a big shift. That's a real big shift. Yeah, it is. Um, you know, we, uh, one thing we haven't really touched on that has been a large portion of your life, uh, you're a certified professional coach. Tell us a little bit about what that's been like. How, how, first of all, how does one become a certified professional coach, but then what have you done with it and, and where has it led you? Mm. Well, again, education is always good. Keep learning. Um, I, was, I got my coaching certification with Fowler uh, Wainwright. Um, and you might know Fowler Learning Institute, Sylvan mm-hmm. Learning. Sure. Um, yep. Well, that's who started this particular coaching. And, you know, it, the good thing is online and with Skype and all of these great things that are available, you can get into a class and you can be on there for hours with other people from around the country. So my certification was done online, but many people – um, do their certification in person. Um, there's, you know, Coach U, Cheryl Richardson, who has, you know, been president of the Coaching Society. Um, she didn't even have, she doesn't have, oddly enough, most people don't know, she she doesn't have a college degree, Cheryl Richardson, you know, mm, wow. best-selling Hay House author. She didn't, she didn't go to college. Um, she's right here in my, in my hometown in the Newport North Shore area of Boston. And she's always talking about, you know, I didn't go to college, but, you know, it's like emotional intelligence. That's the real predictor of success in life. But she does have a coaching certification. And I think the key for coaching, it, for me, I mean, I always I always teach what I want to learn because that's what I'm interested in, in doing. You know, if I want to have – if I want to be happier or I want to live a better life, you know, and I'm going to do that for other people, I have to do that for myself first so coaching really is about asking questions it's just really shifting and asking questions you you know you you want a good answer but you're not going to get that without a good question so if we can ask more questions and consider more possibilities and then then we can visualize it and then we can actually have it happen in our life so you know, for most people in, in coaching, you know, some people do it, you know, they're just doing it all the time. Um, it depends on where you're going and how you're doing it. But I would encourage anybody, even if you didn't want to be a quote unquote coach for a living, get certified in it because when you go through the process of learning, you will teach yourself so much more. And 
you know, it's really, it's just the best thing anybody can do. That's a really interesting idea, the idea of getting a, a, a coaching certification, not so much because you want to go use it to help others, but because it'll help yourself. I don't think most people really think of it that way, but that's a terrific way of looking at it. Well, see, there we go. And we didn't, we didn't set that up, people, but isn't that great? You know, never thought about it that way. That's what, what I have those aha moments about Walt and Louise is I'm listening to you and I'm like, hey, I never thought about it that way. And that, you know, opens our minds. It's like, um, you know, I had a, I, and I never forgot this, my high school teacher, my English high school teacher. You know, how many of us were in high school sitting there going, why do I have to memorize <laughs> the kings and queens and when they lived? Who cares? When I get a job, no one's going to ask me when King Tut existed or when, you know, Queen Elizabeth or whatever, you know. And I remember, you know, a bunch of us in class just sitting there going, you know, Dr. Pittman, come on. What does it matter? Who cares? And he just gave it to us. It's not about you and memorizing these dates. It's the exercise and the process of memorization which increases the net in your mind to catch knowledge. So I am teaching you how to catch more knowledge so that you will be successful in life. And, you know, it's people like that, you know, little things in our life, if we take time to reflect, when was I the happiest? When was I the saddest? When was I really feeling inspired in my life? What is the moment if I was on my deathbed right now that I would remember the most? What would I regret the most? If I was to die as soon as this show ended, who would I want to speak with? You know, if we ask ourselves these types of questions, we will get answers beyond anything that we could ever expect or imagine. And that gives us the ability to get above the clouds. Above the clouds is always the sunshine. If we can get above the clouds, we can see sunshine constantly. And I think that that's what we do to help each other through shows like yours, through books, you know, and somebody listening today will share your show with a friend, and maybe that will help them, you know. So there's, there's different ways that we can, you know, relocate and plant seeds. But the seed that we plant, you know, that saying, you know, count your day by how many seeds you plant and not by the harvest that you get. I think that if we consider that sometimes our job is best, you know, is, 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 is best lived by the good seeds that we plant in the life for others, and one day it will be a good harvest because if we, you know, seed time and harvest, if you plant a good seed, it will grow to be a good harvest. But you don't always sit there and watch the seed come up out of the ground. You know, you go on, you live on, you do other things. And that's how our life is. And in this moment in time, we're together. And we might not be talking to each other for a long time, but the seeds that we've planted here for each other, those are very personal. Those are very unique. Those are yours. Those are mine. And it'll be interesting to see what comes of that. But the fact that we took the time to buy good seeds instead of going to the store marked buy bad seeds here, you know, <laughs> that's the key. It is the key. Um, a couple of times you mentioned uh, self-esteem and how important that is, and surely it is important. For those listeners who might feel their self-esteem really isn't good, has never been very good, and aren't really sure what to do about it, what would you tell somebody like that, somebody who's still trying to figure out, how do I get my own stuff together? Mm. First of all, I would say I totally understand how you feel, and I felt that way many times being a sexually abused victim. You get shame, and that's not you know, I feel bad or think something bad happened to me, that I feel like my whole presence and existence is, 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 you know, there's something wrong with me completely. And, you know, that's the first thing I would say. I have compassion. I understand. The second thing I would say is don't buy the lie. You don't have to buy mm. that bad lie anymore. It's a lie, and you don't need to believe it. Well, how do you, how do you get it to be the truth? that you need to know and feel and experience. You know, I think, and I'll go back to this old 1946 movie. It's one of my all-time favorites. It's A Wonderful Life with Jimmy Stewart and Donna <laughs> Reed. You know, he, he said, I don't want to live. I'm worthless. Nothing in my life matters. Well, he got his wish, and what happened? He realized 
all of the lives he touched. He had no idea. The person, you know, that was handing out the ice cream, the pharmacist, and all of these things that he saw that were a result, that were horrible, because he wasn't in he wasn't in there in his life to be who he was in that tiny little town that didn't seem to matter, you know. George Bailey made a huge difference in life. And think about how you feel if the person you love the most wasn't there. How would your life be? Well, guess what? You're that person for somebody else. You know, if we all reflect on, I love so much, you know, my husband, my mother, maybe it's your dog. How would you feel if that person, you know, wasn't there? Well, you are that for somebody else. So you have to make a commitment to unwrap yourself. You're a gift. You just don't know it. You know, if I have a gift, you give me a gift and I don't unwrap it, well, shame on me. i gotta, I got to take that bow off. i got to see what's in there. And that's what the business of living is about. That's what business, business of living, you have to unwrap yourself and you have to know that you matter. And the only way you're going to know that is by not thinking about yourself. So the first action you can take besides that exercise of who do you love the most and how would you feel if they weren't there, I want people to think about something that they fear the most. Maybe it's homelessness. Maybe it's being alone. Maybe it's not having a job. Maybe it's not being able to eat. Whatever it is, whatever you fear the most, go and volunteer there. Volunteer at that soup kitchen. Volunteer, and it doesn't have to be forever. It just has to be for a day. And maybe it's a volunteer in the grocery store. Maybe, you know, you're worried about aging and being alone, and you see that person in the grocery store that's having a hard time reaching for that can of soup. You go over, and you help them, and you tell them, you give them a compliment, you do something nice, you ask them a question, you engage. That's the best way to get out of yourself and to get into something else because then you realize it was a lie, and you won't have to work very hard at it. It'll just be like the platelets. It will just heal itself. There's something about being in that environment and surrounding yourself with those things that changes and shifts everything. And that's what I have to do. And I continue to eat my own words on a regular basis. So, you know, it's yeah. not it's not like um, all these things we're talking about today. I just did them once and that was it. I don't take my multivitamin once a month and expect it to work. <laughs> you know, I have to water my plants a couple times a week. And I don't resent that. You know, it's Zig Ziglar. Well, that motivational, happy-go-lucky stuff that you guys talk about, you know, that doesn't last. Well... Hey, taking a shower doesn't last either, but you do it every day anyway, <laughs> you know? And that's what we got to do. we got to shift these expectations because if you have a bad road and that's all you can drive on, you're going to go to a bad location. we got to dig new roads. And the psychology, you know, there's so much about that with neuroplasticity. There's so many um, psychological studies that prove that, you know. So as soon as you start that cascade of events, it's a domino effect. It will naturally happen. So don't be so concerned with, you know, the result. You know, the headlights don't see California when you're leaving from Boston. Just start the journey. And the fact that people are here today listening to you, Walt and Louise, they've already begun. So that's the good news. And, you know, we can listen to you all the time and keep taking our multi-mind vitamins. <laughs> well, Deb, we know that uh, you've got to get going yourself because your show is about to get going in, in about five or ten minutes or so. But before we leave you we want and lose you, we wanted to, I'll, I wanted to share one thought with you, your, your uh, idea of bringing in It's a Wonderful Life. I love that. I particularly like at the end of the movie where uh, George Bailey gets the book from Clarence and inscribed in the book says, No man is a failure who has friends. I think that's like a really great, simple message for anybody who's suffering from self-esteem issues. If they've got friends, then they know their life is not a failure. Failure. Their life is a, is a success. Um, but but if again, I had before, a bell, I would ring the bell for the angel right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but before we we lose you, can you tell people where they can find out more about you? Well, thank you very much. And before I go, I want to thank you so much for having me on the show. I just love your work and what you're doing, and you're helping people be their best. And I know that you know it's you've got something I want to catch too. So thank you very 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 much. 
Um, people can go to greensky-and-bluegrass.com, greensky-and-bluegrass.com. I have a monthly Mind Vitamin newsletter. I have blog posts. You'll find links to the radio show, the Best People We Know radio show on Blog Talk Radio, uh, links to the book. It's on Kindle now, and so for three ninety nine, that's that's pretty good. Most people like the Kindle thing, and just um, different people are there and and resources. So it's it's kind of a happy place, and I hope people stop by. And I'm also on Twitter at Green Sky Deb. She's everywhere. She's everywhere. Oh yes, yeah, right. Good, just good. Uh, we need to be everywhere. Oh my goodness, uh, you know, we, like I said, we're just sticking with the good story, and that's that's how it goes. We're just the best people we know, and that's the story, and we're sticking to it. All right. Well, Deb Scott, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. We'll see you all next time here on LOA Today. Goodbye, everybody.